Let's go. G'day guys, welcome to the next episode of Two Red Chairs. Today I am joined by Mr. Jacob Cass here. He's a fellow Aussie designer. Um, a lot of you will probably know him from his Instagram account or his huge email list, whichever way you know Jacob. Um, we're going to talk today about a bit of his origin story, where he's got to in his career in the last 10 years, um, to the heights of working with the likes of Disney, Jerry Seinfeld, and lately, the city of San Francisco. Just a little town. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, welcome, mate. How you doing? Very well. Thank you. So, uh, let's rewind all the way back to uh, uni days, because a lot of uh, people that are either watching this or following this G'day Design Life um, Instagram page are just graduating uni or are still in uni here in Australia. So, wh- where was it you studied? Uh, Un- University of Newcastle. Newcastle. What, what kind of student were you? I like to party. <laughs> like to party? Yeah. Party animal, love it. Yeah, it was good fun <laughs> being up there, but that is uni life. But yeah. it, it did pave the way for me to to get a job. And um, I'm kind of sk- skipping ahead here, but I was studying at university and I got mm. offered a job in New York City. Okay. And yeah, that kind of... Catapulted. Yes. In terms of the work that you were outputting at uni in your uni days, was it... Looking back at it, do you think it was of a good sort of quality? Were you getting good marks out of it? Yeah, I, I think it was a better quality than the other students I was with. But looking back on it now, I realize it wasn't so good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> but like um, yeah, I was always I was always like the person mentoring other people or giving shoots to other people in the okay. class and okay. ended up getting um, an award from the uni for being like a young alumni. Um, nice. So that was pretty, pretty cool. That was to get recognition. Yeah, yeah, was yeah, a couple of years after. Yep, yep. Um, so yeah, it was. I had good work, but it wasn't the caliber of working for Disney, I say, which is mm. what I went from being a student to working for Disney. It's a but pretty big contrast, yeah. then. Yeah, yeah, nice. So you finished uni in uh, 2010. Uh, you're testing my memory now. I th- about that. I yeah. think we're the same age. Yeah. So I think it was probably yeah. at the same time. I think we both graduated. Good. But I'm glad you knew. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just thinking about because someone asked me yesterday. I was like, "Well, when did you graduate?" I'm like. Oh, it was like nearly 10 years ago now. I know, it's crazy. Um, so from that period, you then jet off to New York City. Um, how did you get contact though first? About uh, so I was running a lot of social when I was kind of pretty new at the time. I was um, getting a name for myself on Twitter and mm-hmm. I was pretty po- I was posting consistently on there. So I was putting myself out there and that got the attention of this um, agency in New York that was focused on digital media and social media, which was pretty new back then because yeah. a lot of the agencies or the bigger ones were um, trying to play catch up or they weren't even started yet. So um, because I was pretty active in social media and uh, 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 that got the attention of them. So they tweeted me actually and said, oh, can we have uh, an interview? <laughs> yeah, can we have an interview? Can we interview you? We have a, um, a job offer for you. Um, I still had six months to go at university. So I told them that and they said, that's cool, finish your studies and then after you can come over. So that's what yeah, I did. It was a perfect opportunity. You can't really turn that down. And Would yeah. you, if they said, no, we won't let you, like you, it needs to be now or never, would you have just dropped it? Yeah, because you can, you can come back and do studies. Yeah, so you just, you, I'd be yeah, out there too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> such, yeah, I didn't even know who their clients were. Such, I didn't know Disney was going to be there, but yeah, it just went straight in. So, so you, yeah, the, so it was an agency that obviously then had a client as being Disney. That was, yes, yeah, yeah, cool. Um, and so you, you jet over to New York post-graduation and what's that experience like? Well, moving to New York is um, difficult, especially when you don't know anyone. I didn't know what areas to be in or anything like that. I had no idea. Like, I'd never been there before. So mm. it's always scary, but I found uh, a place to live the day before I left. <laughs> that shows how... Lucky. <laughs> lucky, <laughs> yeah. lucky, lucky, lucky. So I ended up um, staying in Brooklyn for a while. And um, yeah, I didn't have any friends, of course, but uh, they the were a very um, social agency. And yeah, they, they got everyone involved. And it was pretty small at the time. I think they were about seven people. I was a seventh employee and yeah, they went right. on to be about um, 70 or so at the end of it. And then they got bought out by another company. But just moving overseas, it's um, challenging if you want to rent a place. Like I subletted at first through mm. Craigslist, mm-hmm. but to get a, a, a rental of your own, you have to have X amount of income and uh, all yeah, your documents like, and stuff. It's really it's like difficult. N- now I heard a YouTuber was just watching a video today and she was saying it was something like it needs to be 40 times your annual income for monthly 
rent or something like that. Yeah, it's obviously. something like that. I mean, we obviously we didn't have that at the time, so we um, we had my wife's brother who was a guarantor, yeah, which nice. thankfully yeah, that's good. worked out. Yeah. So, what kind of work did that lead to while working there? I mean, to have a to, you know for them to play a gamble of a, a recent graduate that has shown some promise, obviously on Twitter and, and the other aspects of what you were doing then at the time in social media. What did they see in you? And then was it doing that similar work that you kind of put out there, or was it kind of anything and everything that was designed? Uh, uh, it was. Oh, so I went went to be a junior designer. That was my title yep. at the time. So the first six months, I actually worked for this company, and then they let me go. Okay. So I had um, I had to get a new job, and I got a new job. I went home, got a different visa, mm-hmm. um, and I worked for a number of different agencies over a year. And they. Um, I got to get experience from these different agencies and see what I actually like doing. Mm-hmm. And then at the end of the year, after my visa expired or was going to expire, I found a company that was um, that I wanted to work at. So I went home again <laughs> to get a visa. Yeah. It's such a uh, such a pain, but yeah, I wanted <laughs> to be in New York, and it was great. So made it happen, um, and I worked for this other agency for about four years, and that's where I got access to um, even bigger brands such as the. Um, the Nintendos and Jerry Seinfeld and all that that you mentioned earlier. So when that comes along, those kinds of jobs, so let's say Nintendo, <laughs> do you, and I've had experiences with the likes of like Star Wars and, and, and Disney it, through my previous job, and it, it's always always very stringent in what you have to do and can do, and there's, <laughs> there's some serious no wiggle room in that. Um, so in terms of the way that you would approach that design for, for that agency you're working with, did you find that similar constraint of your creativity or was it just sort of, and it, was it getting just a job done and not really being able to flex your, <laughs> your yeah, creativity? Yeah, no, I was really fortunate because Nintendo was a, a great client because we got to work with all different games, which meant you could work in different styles. Yeah, awesome. um, so I was working as an interactive designer, so I was doing the UI and UX for all these um, companies. There are a lot of game sites, obviously. Okay. So um, they'll give us a brief and access to their high-res images, which are awesome, by the way. You can mm-hmm. zoom in and see all the hairs and yeah. everything like that. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you get all the assets and you have a brief, and they're like, uh, we have... X amount of pages and this is what we want to communicate and then they give you creative liberty to art direct how the site is going to be okay. um, how it functions and all of that and then using that assets um, to build out the page but obviously you have to build everything around the assets and tell the story and yep. show the characters and all of that so um, that was a, a great client because yeah we had a lot of um, creative liberty to, nice. to move with and then with um, Mr. Jerry Seinfeld like I'm a big fan of Seinfeld and this, yeah, is, yeah. Like, <laughs> this is what I, I really like um the reason why Jacob is here is not because of that, but it, I, I always like <laughs> talking to Jacob just about this because um, I've watched Seinfeld and watched comedians in cars getting coffee, which is the identity that Jacob's made um, as part of his time working in the States. So you met Jerry? Yeah, I worked with him. It's hey. kind of probably my most nerve-wracking meeting, to be honest. Yeah, I was going to say, well, how, 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 what was the feeling like in that room? Well, of- there, there's like, there was a team involved, obviously, and then we had creative directors and um, everything mm-hmm. in the room. But I was the, uh, the I had a graphics tablet at the time, so I was often doing um, edits with them in the room and mm-hmm. like <laughs> all our companies, marketing directors and the CEO and then his marketing team. And I'm like there with my graphics tablet and like a big projector. And I was like, <laughs> it's really nerve wracking. So this is like a second or third meeting in, obviously after a first a couple of um, yeah uh, rounds. But it was, I did get to meet him and um, have a, a small chat with him. Um, but yeah, he's a, a busy man as you can imagine. Yeah. And then the process of that, how for something like that as a TV show, it didn't start on Netflix like it is now. It was on um Crackle, I think it was. Uh, yeah, it was on Crackle and his own website. Yep, so, right, um, yeah. yeah, it's not on the website anymore, but I was involved with doing the, the actual website and how that yeah, looked okay. and um, felt for the first uh, six seasons, I believe it was. Yep. Um, so they updated every na- every season or so. Yep. Um, the logo stayed the same the whole time and the marketing style, which is like a we created a typeface um, and we used that for all their marketing. Oh, nice. um, so that was a, a, po- a cool project. Yeah. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, you'll have seen the, the graphics of what that looks like. Um, but if you're listening on the podcast, check it out. It's a really good show aside from the design, but the design at the same time, I think, gives that nice look of aesthetic of what Jerry's about in terms of writing his notes and, and things like that for his sketches. I think that's where it sort of ties in, which I think is a great little identity. Totally. Um, from there then, you come back to Australia, yeah? Yeah, so that was that project was 2012. Okay. Um, so I was there for another few years and actually went traveling for 
what was meant to be one year and it turned into three years. So <laughs> it was traveling the world. Travel bug. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Nice. So I'd always loved traveling and I'd wanted to travel the world after a bit of convincing with my wife. I, yep. We saved enough money for the first year, but I realized uh, once I left a full-time position, I had way more time to work on my own business. Yep. Um, I did have some runway to, to work on the road and I had that business set up and blog um, just creative set up. So I had some clients and I had some passive income coming in to be able to travel on the road. Um, so we traveled for uh, that one year and we're like, well, let's do this for more. <laughs> so we did it for two more years, <laughs> went to about 80 countries uh, while running the, the blog and the business uh, on the road as well. And we also ran a, our travel blog too. So in terms of the, the both the blogs then, how long has that sort of been running for then? So I started my business Just Creative Design, which is now called Just Creative, back in 2007. Yeah. Um, so I've been running that, while I ran that while I was a design student mm -hmm. and I've continued to evolve that um, into, and still is my business today. So it's called Just Creative and um, the blog is called Just Globetrotting. Yeah, nice. And was the, the travel blog then um, a Jacob idea or a uh, Mrs. Jacob idea? So originally, <laughs> originally uh, I it was for friends and family and um, my wife wasn't really clued into blogging or anything at that stage and she wanted to do it for friends and family. So she did it, does all the writing pretty much, about 90% yep. of the writing. And I do all the SEO photos um, and so forth. Yep. And yeah, it was, it was a good team. And after the first year, we kind of pivoted to be more focused on resources for people traveling versus our stories yeah, yeah. we kind of yeah, we nice. did both so we kind of have a hybrid we have stories and guides yep. um, so it's kind of a different way of put, uh, doing it um, but it the travel insula travel influencer market is uh, another beast now it's yeah it's kind of taken over you do it gone with the days of those um lonely planet kind of guides and everything everyone's looking for an experience that some they can see someone else have and, and build trust that way especially if they follow you as if as the face of it um, I can see why <laughs> I can definitely see why it takes off. Yeah, and and everyone's an influencer these days. Like people with a thousand followers can be uh, <laughs> an influencer. <laughs> That's yeah. It. Um, now you come back to Australia, you start doing more of your work here. What kind of clients then are you working with, or are you still doing the whole agency um, contract kind of work? Uh, clients now the well I. So I've been back for about a year and a half now, more full time. So I've had more time to focus on that business and social media and so forth. So the clients I'm focused on now, um, they're very diverse. I have a very wide casting net because my blog, I get a lot of traffic and mm -hmm. that means I get a lot of exposure. Um, and that means all the industries are different. I don't have a niche um, on any particular client. Okay. So um, my strategy may not work for listeners, just so yeah. you're aware of that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I have a wide casting net. So it's um, I work with some agencies, but to be honest, most of them are small, mid-sized businesses. Um, not very, n none of them are really enterprise at this at this stage. But at the moment, I'm learning. Uh, we'll dive in deeper into um, brand strategy and how I can offer a deeper service for my clients. And um, I think for people starting out, this would be too much of a step. It's you do need to do the legwork in in terms of your craft to get to this step mm -hmm. and know the reasons why and the thinking behind it before you get to that. But that's really where I'm going now and um, offering that deep level of service while also doing design. So, how do yeah. you find that? Like, do you, when you kind of came across brand strategy, was it kind of for you like the missing piece that, of, of what you're doing? Because obviously you do a lot of logo design um, and do it very, very well. But then having that missing piece of that adding the client into the equation better, how, how, have, you find, how have you found that? Well, brand strategy is a deep, deep rabbit hole. And yeah. once you're aware of it, you can keep going deeper and deeper. So yep. um, you could actually do a very thorough brand stra strategy document for your client and it could take months if you really wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, this may be overkill for a lot of small mid-sized businesses. So you have to tailor it to the client. But most of the time, the clients aren't really aware of it. So there's a big educational gap that you have to mm. talk it through and sell it through so mm -hmm. you really have to know how to sell sell things and talk about it and be confident and that's really when they're going to put the trust in you and actually give you those uh, big dollar signs and how do you find that like you find the clients are fairly receptive of, of brand strategy when you are now selling it like it's hit or miss like some uh, think it's overkill and it may be for for some some yeah. brands and that's fair enough it, it is to be honest yeah. um but for 
um, brands that really are going all in and they want to have a better connection with their consumer and have a roadmap to succeed, then it is something that they should focus on. And mm-hmm. I, I talk about the benefits of it. Um, but yeah, some, some startups may not be ready for it or they just don't invest that in at this time. Um, that's cool too. And do you think from your own experience then that it, it would um, better your output of um, a brand identity? Like, do you uh, use it for mutual beneficial reasons that the client can walk away with a strategy of what they do with their brand but also for you does that better inform the the creative output that you create as well yeah I, I've, al- I've always followed a pretty similar process in following like or creating a brand identity yep. so i did have a process there and it was some strategic thinking but it wasn't as informed as going deep with customer journeys and yep. um all the other stuff which I won't bore you with at this time but <laughs> I'm um, going to talk about another podcast with yeah yeah another couple of blokes but yeah yeah it, it, I think it's something for a lot of designers that especially when I came across it when I started my business it was it's one of those things that you just go boom yeah yeah and yeah you're just like holy moly I, I this is this is a whole other game in itself but from I guess my experience of doing it a few times now it's one of those things that if you can better serve a customer to create a better result. I think that's where it can come in. But at the same respect, if there's a double arbitrage of you being able to offer a client something that they'd not even considered, let's say their messaging or just even who their customers are. Like I think a lot of businesses as well have a fair idea of who their customer is, but then don't know how to chat with them, communicate with them, whatever it is, and create something that isn't just what they want as a business and what what their customers want to see or recognize so they're not having this, you know, elaborate logo that, you know, obviously you're not the one to create a kind of elaborate logo. You're very, um, not simple. Simple isn't the right word. Simplistic in the, in the, the nature of the designs that you create, which I think is the best way to go about logos. Um, but for, for a brand to realize what it is that that customer is looking for rather than having some detailed as fuck logo. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this can kind of get them on that page and, and ride them on the same journey that you're going through to create something and, and get a bit of skin in the game for themselves into that process and feel part of it, which I think is just great. So um, you've done an absolute crap load of logos. Yeah. Like thousands. <laughs> thousands. And we've, if you've seen Jacob's um, page or do you have Behance? Uh, just yeah, just yeah. set up hands, yeah. So if you look at his stuff and you see what he does and creates, um, nothing looks the same, but everything has that minimal kind of look to it and, and it, it communicates a very good logo for that business. So if you're, I guess this is my point, is that if you're struggling with logo design and wondering how to be better at logo design and you're looking at people like Jacob here, or other designers around the world or in Australia or wherever it is, have a look at what these guys are doing to see what works for these kinds of businesses. Now, this is le- next leads me to the, the latest logo that Jacob's done for this little town in America called San Francisco. And if you look at the case study that Jacob's made for that, you will see a great amount of iteration involved to get it to the most simple form possible. Um, so how, firstly, how did that come about? <laughs> Cause San Francisco is San Francisco, yep. you know, the next height would be New York or London or anything like that. Yeah, That's next. <laughs> um, exactly. So talk us through that process from sort of start to finish of inception to, to completion. Obviously it was done with another team of creatives as well. Um, so yeah. Yeah. So I guess people ask, or often people ask, how do you, how did you get that job? Yeah. And this was an existing relationship with another agency. So this agency had subcontracted me out to um, design some the, some logo variations and some branding or brand identity ideas. And they had hired me for another country called Puerto Rico. Um, <laughs> Just Puerto pre- Rico. Previously. Just a freaking country. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so that was the first relationship. Um, first start of that relationship and um, my work actually wasn't picked they they'd hired out another that had hired a few other subcontracted a few other designers and mine got to the last round but got um, didn't win based on user testing yep so for the second round um, for San Francisco it was the same client same agency subcontracted I was hired um, amongst 
other designers and we all submitted to this agency. And then they um, sent it to the agency based on the short list of that, that, what they chose. Um, and mine came back um, up the top and then it went to user testing with a few others and thankfully came out on top and that's how it got picked and mm. is in use now, which is really cool, um, very humbling. And yeah. This is the thing, like I, I went to dinner with Jacob a few months back to this industry dinner and we sat down at a table and had a, a good bro chat. Um, but we were sit, sat next to another couple and um, they introduced themselves. They, they had a furniture brand here in Sydney, really high class furniture, furniture brand. And they turned to both of us and said, what do you guys do? And we said, we both said branding. And they said, oh, would you have done anything that we would have seen? And Jacob's like, oh, yeah, just San Francisco. And they just went... <laughs> sort of scoffed on their wine and bread and went, oh, yeah, 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 okay. <laughs> yeah, good, 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 good. Yeah, it's so, a nice little feather in the hat. Yeah, yeah, I love it. So in terms of logos then, what would be your favourite of your own and then favourite of whatever's out there that you think is, you know... That's a good question. Right up there. Um, favourite of my own, that's a good question. I, the, I haven't really thought about that. I. The San Fran one is the most recent one that I'm, I'm quite proud of because mm. of um, that it got this San Francisco, yeah. Francisco. <laughs> um, but I, I recently did like a, a highlight reel of my past decade of the logos that I liked from each year. And it was really hard to go through thousands of logos and choose one from mm. each year. Mm. Um, but yeah, that's one of my Insta and they're, they're all my favorites. And San Fran was the, the latest one. So I'm going to go with that. Nice. Um, what was the second part? Which oh, is my, your favorite logo? My favorite logo. Well, I'm yeah. always... <laughs> it's so cliche, but I love the Apple logo because it's an apple and the bite's taken out of it. And I'm always on Apple products. So, like, I'm exposed to it every single bloody day. So, it's just dug into my mind. So Yeah, you see it in front of your face, especially working as a designer yeah, with exactly. an Apple computer in front of you or your phone or your watch or your Apple TV or whatever it is. It's just everywhere. Yeah. Um, but one, I, I, another one I really like, um, not for the company, but BP. So yeah. it's like a flower logo, it's green and yellow. And uh-huh. um, I think it's a great example of how powerful logo design can be because this is an oil company. They, they don't do great things, you yeah, know. Yeah. And the image of this logo is a bright flower. And it's like, I'm so environmentally friendly. I'm, I'm complete opposite of what I'm actually doing. And that's how powerful logo design is. And that's why I, I like that. And it's just a brilliant mark. I think it's interesting you bring that up is that I think BP ended up doing that around the time of their big oil scandal in, <laughs> out yeah. in the oceans. And the, yeah. It, 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 I think it was widely criticised. Yeah, yeah, you're making a flower now and you've got yeah. this big hole in the ocean. I know. Oh, no, no, it wasn't not, good timing. Not good timing, but I think in terms of, yeah, brand longevity, it's, it's obviously a difference for them to to be able to posi- reposition themselves as someone that is now eco-conscious because of a result of <laughs> some really bad shit happening in their business. Um, so that's where I think branding definitely can come into play, but that's the whole other conversation. Okay. Um, now to get back to your email marketing. Now, if you've been doing your blog since 2007, which is, I don't know how you keep coming up with ideas. Um, I, mean, I, I could like... I don't have enough time. There's yeah, so many. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's probably the thing. A lot of people would, for even social media content, go, how, how, do, you, how do I keep coming up with ideas for content? But I think that's such a weird mindset to kind of have because if you keep learning and, and accessing different things or experiencing different things, you're going to have something new to talk about all the time. Like it's when you meet new people, you always got someone new to talk to and, and gain that experience from or whatever. So... For you in terms of that blog, how, how has that kept going and that interest kept going and the consistency kept going to, to make it what it is now? It's a good question. And um, I had a chat with um, another um, show and they, we had talked about this. And the reason was I share what I'm doing at the time. Yeah. So this is how I actually got headhunted in, in, from, from in the States. It was because I was sharing my university work. I was sharing what I was learning. I was okay. sharing my process. I was sharing um, my really bad work <laughs> well this is i'll just touch on that quickly as well before you keep going when i was at uni and a couple of my fellow students that i graduated with have said i remember jacob's work being shown in one of my one of the, our lectures and i can't remember bugger all from uni days in terms of what we had in lectures but i was like seriously like mm. that's amazing and we we're obviously at the same age and, and process of being at uni so i don't know how it came about and one of our lecturers must have come across your work in some way shape or form so that just shows from two different unis and and what maybe maybe i don't know they might have had a relationship with someone from from jacob's uni but 
I, I found it amazing that yeah. this yeah, yeah. particular girl, Mary, well, was like, I'll, yeah, yeah, I'll tell you the secret. It's because there was no other blogs out there. <laughs> no one else doing it. Yeah, exactly. exactly. You found the hole. Yeah, the uh, hole. for sure. Um, but... Uh, Wait, what were in you? terms of consistency. Yeah, yeah, consistency. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I put out what I'm learning at the, the time. And yeah, it was at university. I was sharing my university work. And fast forward well, 12 years now, uh, I'm learning more about brand strategy. So the content I put out is focused on brand strategy. It's mm-hmm. um, nothing radical here. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just sharing your process and sharing what you're doing. And uh, I posted a post on Insta yesterday about uh, daring to suck. And I love that <laughs> quote because you dare, <laughs> dare to suck. You, your first thing is always going to be the worst. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're going to improve by doing it. So um just like myself, like doing a brand strategy workshop with a client, like I'm sure um, 10, 10 more down the track, or they'll be much better than what I'm doing now. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. You get better and better. Yeah. And I think that's the thing with a lot of designers that will put stuff out and think that it, they have to be original all the time. Like you, you can talk about the same topic someone else is talking about. I think that's the big thing where, I mean, yeah. I, I, <laughs> I finally called jake about the other day where he put up a oh, yeah. similar <laughs> post of 99 problems and branding is it one i was like hey man <laughs> i did that a few weeks back yeah and he's like man i didn't see it and i was like it doesn't matter like he can put out the same stuff and i just did it as a joke but everyone's yeah, about the same thing there's only so much you can really yeah. talk about in the scope of design so you may as well add your two cents to the conversation and not have to feel like you're a, a thought leader or anything like that and just you know contribute to the conversation which i think you do very well um, and put it, your own spin on it, put your own branding to it, so that way it, you know, it is authentically you in a way. Um, and then in terms of that blog leading to your uh, email marketing, so you now do a, a newsletter, and how long has that kind of been going um, for? So I've always had, it was RSS back in the day, and people would subscribe to RSS yeah, feeds, yeah, yeah, and yeah, that yeah, kind yeah, of got yeah, fizzled yeah. out. And then we started a newsletter and uh, kind of start, started growing that. I wish I'd done it earlier, but mm. I'd um, just run RSS feeds. Um, so that was my biggest regret, and I'd highly recommend getting an email newsletter set up. It's the best way to contact um, people that want to hear from you and yep. have that in their inbox it's so good um very personal yeah exactly Mm. um and actually all of my social and everything um leads to my email marketing because that is the best way to contact people the thing with social media is that it you the posts go and you you don't always interact there's so much noise where a newsletter is one-on-one so it's a huge draw that's why i've put a, a ton of effort into creating an email list and having freebies that um, people get when they sign up mm-hmm. and that way i can also send them all my new articles resources freebies um, and also um, what we'll talk about next is affiliate marketing so i yeah. recommend uh, different tools and give them discounts and it's a pretty much a win-win for everyone uh, and that's what i've, I've really been focusing on as well yeah. as my services and then for do you find that um clients I, do you have clients in that email list and how if they if you do then how receptive is it even if you have content in those newsletters that is targeted at other designers what how does that kind of work yeah for you? so that's that's where I'd, my downfall is i haven't segmented my list which is a next step so you can choose if like they can either say if they're a client or mm. business owner or a designer or so forth and i haven't actually done that but um, people come and go all the time like I'll get 100 subscribers a day and probably like 40 will unsubscribe a day. Mm-hmm. So it's it's a very up and down sort of thing. But it's um, like if they're enjoying your content, they'll continue to open your emails. And that's yeah. where that relationship comes yeah. um, or is built. And then you're top of mind when it comes to whatever you're promoting. So for me, I, I always have a the backbone of brand in, in, in my emails as well. So that's that's why they why I'd be top of mind for them. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think that's a big thing of any kind of content that you would make in that you want to stay top of mind with your clients or audience, whoever it is that you're marketing yourself towards, be it social media or your email marketing. So, um, you know, if that client is someone that may have, or potential client is someone that may not need it now, they may need it in three months or five years, depending on how (laughs) the longevity of your business and how long you're doing this stuff like Jacob has been doing. So um, yeah, don't discount the fact that someone's not coming now. If you keep doing it consistently, somebody may remain dormant, yeah? Yeah, it's a long, long-term game. And then in terms of your online, um, let's say your website, to, to make somebody subscribe to that email list then, is it a, is, is it a case of a, a lead magnet like you probably have on your site where it's in exchange for 
a email address to be able to sign you up to your newsletter um, because I've seen that you know the cost of a email for someone to give out is around ten to fifteen dollars in equivalent value, and then what are you giving in return for that value of somebody you know handing over something as kind of personal now as an email address? Yeah, so for me personally, I have uh, a tool a toolbox which is yep. called the Brandon Briefcase, which mm-hmm. is basically a bunch of ebooks and tools and um, mockups and um, sh- worksheets and everything that can help a business grow and thrive. So it's really um, it's it's really deep in what I provide. But you don't have to go if you're creating your own. You don't need to go as deep as that. It's as simple as giving a freebie away, a, a worksheet, a checklist. Yep. Um, something free of value so that's really the incentive don't just say sign up or join my newsletter you're not going to get um, as many um, subscribers so yeah, yeah it, the value up front and your email drip campaign which is what emails they get after they sign up should also provide value you shouldn't be selling up yeah, front that's a good bit of advice then so in terms of then for yourself how many emails is somebody getting after that first initial sign up like is it like a couple two or so three I've, I've got six at the moment okay. um i do have plans to do add like or like uh 20 plus so they yeah nice. so once they're they're in they can just get dripped my campaign my content mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. i do send out a newsletter at least once a week so they're going to get something anyway yeah but for when i'm away or um just so they can get, get content and see what uh sort of stuff i put out there uh, i'm going to set something else up and just quickly as well on the email list, uh, email subscribers and doing a newsletter plus social media, plus client work and everything. How are you managing that time? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So I, I do have this platform set up already. So you have to be clear. It does take time to set up. Um, the best thing about email is that it's automated. Uh, yeah. You're not actually spending time doing it. You do it once and it, you can it do it for out. years. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you can build systems and automations into your business, do it. Like that is the key. So if you haven't got an email newsletter, get that set up because that is the biggest thing that will save you time. You're not going out looking for clients. You actually position yourself in a, as an expert and um, people are getting value from you and mm. so forth. So. Uh, that's a big tip to to get involved and it doesn't have to be you don't have to be putting out content every week uh, although that's a good idea at least you could do it maybe once a month you could start there and then Mm -hmm. once you know the ropes and you can make it every two weeks or so forth so yeah i mean i i'm totally slacking like i've only been doing this business for 18 months but i don't have any of this and i'm just like man i need to get something up and like I see things like um, MailChimp and ConvertKit and all those kinds of um, sites that do it. So it's easy to do. I think it's just the conviction of actually sitting down and actually doing it to set and kind of not forget, but having to set it all up. Yeah. And then that way you can just do it on a, as Jacob said, on a monthly basis and then try and remain consistent. And all it can be, like if you're making, let's say, social media content like you, you do and you put up a post every couple of days or whatever, you could include that content and make that into a blog and then you know yeah, attach that to your, to your newsletter, exactly what you do, which is all it really probably needs so to be. So why haven't you done it? <laughs> I know, and this is it. I just like, I just create content. It's just like, I'm not putting it into anything else. And um, I think the comparison for, for between Jacob and say Shane that I had on the first episode was that Shane gets out there and hustles that way. Whereas Jacob does it a bit differently digitally, which both ways can still work for your business very, yeah. very well, which is a testament to show you how well it can work because the subscriber list that you have is what? A few th- hundred. Like, yeah, it's about 28,000. 28,000. So that's yeah. a, it's a shitload of people there tuning in each week or if you did it monthly. Um, and that obviously is done over time. Yeah. It's not overnight success or anything like that. But if you do it and it compounds and compounds and compounds and you're offering that value over and over and over, um, you never know who you're going to bring in. And that's what I look at my analytics and see some people that view my site. And it's not many, but you'll probably do the same and you'll look at your the you know the demographic of people that are coming in and especially if they're australians and you're in australia and you're going who are those people are they fellow designers or are they other clients if they're clients then they're walking away off my site not having done anything apart from contacting me and if no one's contacting me then you're not to know if you know they've found any value from your site apart from just the amount of time they've spent on your site so i think legion definitely is a great way to go about it um yeah so legions i i i 
put everywhere on my site. So it's mm-hmm. the one thing. Like, I don't have much advertising, very little. Mm-hmm. Um, and the lead gen thing is everywhere. So on my homepage, about <coughs> page, it's a pop-up, it's a sidebar, and the foot. Oh, so that's <laughs> how everywhere. valuable an email is. <laughs> yeah, it's literally everywhere. Um, and yeah, once you have it all set up, it's all automated, as, as yeah, you said. Nice. And I guess that leads into um, your affiliate marketing because a lot of yeah. your content then surrounds itself around affiliate um, links and things. And I'll let Jacob explain what the whole affiliate part is but think of this guys as a way to gain extra income or extra exposure in a way that is providing value at no extra cost to that person if they're looking to sign up to a course or sign up to or buy a book or, or whatever a packet of ramen noodles that I've seen you, yeah. you generate <laughs> income from um, think of this as a way to diversify your income in a way that is having you find and recommend the best things that work have worked for you and give that recommendation to somebody else through your content and then gain a little bit of a commission out of it. That's right, yeah? Yeah, exactly. So how does that work then for you? What's the process involved and, and what, if you could explain affiliate marketing, yeah, yeah. especially probably better because you do this. You know, yeah, all the so time. to jump into affiliate marketing, the idea is you, I recommend something, you click it, I get a commission. Yeah. Um, and you can do this on scale, which is what I do on the blog. And I'm going to put in the context of, of you though, so how you can get it set up. And one program that is very successful is Amazon, Amazon Associates program. So I recommend a book or a laptop or whatever it is and make a money from that. But the best thing about the Amazon Associate program is that whatever is in the cart, you make a commission on. So if I recommend a book, which is like 10 bucks, I'm going to get a commission of, I don't know, 15 cents or something. But if they go on and buy uh, a laptop in that same cart, and I'll get a commission of the laptop and the book. So that's that's where it, the, the goal is. Yeah, yeah. that's why you sh- <laughs> I've seen your list of stuff that you've brought in and there's weird stuff like people ordering pizzas on yeah, Amazon yeah. in so, the States. Uh, yeah, I don't know why, but for the past <laughs> six to nine months, there's, there's like 20 frozen pizzas every month on this list. I don't know. <laughs> Like I've never side. recommended pizza, but yeah, it's Someone's just getting funny. a hankering for <laughs> Jacob's. Just, everyone's just <laughs> yeah. hungry after looking at this site. <laughs> Top 10 laptops. Um, but for you to get started with affiliate marketing, this is kind of a challenge. Um, you sign up to Amazon Associates program. You just, you just enter your details and your bank details so you can get paid. Uh, and then once you've got a, your that set up, go to any product page on Amazon. At the top of the page is um Something that says get link, generate yep. link. Yep. Um, top left, you'll find it. And then you copy paste that link and that's the link that you use to track. Mm-hmm. So find out, find something that you really love, like a book or um, like, let's just say your favorite book and you, you post on um, Facebook or social media and say, this is, I love this book, it's my favorite. Mm-hmm. I recommend it for this reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, and people that trust you and follow you will likely buy that book. And then yeah. you've made your first sca- sale. If you do this on your website, your platform, which you own, or your social media, you can scale this idea. So let's say your top 10 books on branding yeah. and then they, so forth. And mm-hmm. that, that's what I've done on scale with like best laptops, best everything for designers. So mm-hmm. I've got a whole buying guide for um, for this um, whole system. Yeah. But the, the real killer is having good SEO. So search engine optimization, being ranked on Google, because then if they find your site, they're actually a hot lead looking for this information. You're not actually selling it yourself. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. once you learn search engine optimization and you're ranked well, you, that's where the money is. Okay. Um, I mean, Jacob was the, the one that kind of <laughs> kicked me in the ass to get onto Amazon if, um, Associates. So I signed up. So if you're watching this on YouTube, you'll see the example of this in the notes below in the description where I've got all the gear that I used for this podcast of the camera, the mic, the, the lights, um, mics, all the rest of it, tripod. Um, it, it's all there and it's basically, if you were interested in buying the same kind of camera or the same mic or whatever, you can click on that link and it will take you to that Amazon cart. So if you're creating this kind of content or you're doing a blog or whatever and you found a product that you really like and would recommend to somebody, that, that's the whole idea. Yeah? And then if that person buys it, you get a commission and it's not like you're charging that person extra or anything like that it's It's a win-win for everyone it's a win-win for everybody so there's nothing scummy about it or salesy about it it's just here this is this is this is exactly what i think you know would be beneficial to you and if it is great buy it it'd help me out you know if i brought you some value here by doing so i think it's a great little exchange yeah absolutely and it's not just amazon it's not products you can recommend Mm. anything there's so many other plat like affiliate programs out there pretty much every software um or web app generally has it like the big ones so Mm -hmm. Popular ones that work for me are um, Udemy and Skillshare, um, some icon packs and font bundles and mm-hmm. graphic resources for designers. So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, yeah, just 
just don't pigeonhole yourself to Amazon. You can use other uh, people to work with and partner with them as well. And yeah. often I'll work with partners and try to negotiate a, a deal for my readers. So it's kind of like an exclusive yeah, discount. Nice. Uh, and that's just the next level. Yeah, so if you get to the echelon, I think probably the one thing probably to keep in mind, I'd, I'd say you'd agree with this, is doing it with stuff that either you have found or used yourself or that is in the realm of what you're talking about. Like, don't just be <laughs> like the top, you know, five washing machines or yeah, something yeah, yeah. like that, you that's know? True. Something so you know, that's true. You know your thing. audience. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, we all need washing machines. <laughs> um, but I think that's probably, you know, I think that's obviously fairly logical, but to try and keep it in the realm of what it is you're talking about. Um, well, let's, let's just say uh, we have designers or cr- like illustrators. We all have different mm-hmm. niches. And mm-hmm. um, if you're an illustrator, you're going to focus more on illustrative courses versus yeah. Yeah. Um, me where I'm doing more electronics and things that are, useful for a lot of people so Mm -hmm. you just start small and with your niche and your audience and um and grow it from there yeah i think it's a great uh, a great way to go about just that diversifying your income because i think like if you are a designer and you're solely relying on client work especially running your own business let's say or even if you wanted to do it as a side hustle like if you're in a full-time job and you're looking for an extra bit of cash and starting up a blog and doing what jacob has done um over time like it's not going to happen overnight though yeah no. yeah so it takes a hell of a lot of work or just a hell of a lot of time to to get it to work at scale and and bring in you know thousands of dollars a month which is what jacob's bringing in which i find just amazing um so you know kudos man yeah um so look i think in terms of where where you're headed in for your uh your business what's on the horizon then for for just creative like is it sort of more travel is it well, looking to work with more bigger clients like yeah uh, i'm just trucking along to be honest yeah. but i'm i did mention going towards the brand strategy route yep. uh who knows where that's going to take me mm-hmm. uh we're not sure yet but uh definitely going to travel as well going to be living in cape town for january and february next year nice. and then who are who knows after that we have some plans for korea or um, asia i don't know where else um, maybe hawaii so they're the rough goals at the moment mm-hmm, mm-hmm, um mm-hmm. but yeah just putting out content and learning along the way is it's awesome yeah awesome. actually go more in with affiliate marketing Why go, <laughs> go more with affiliate market yeah yeah, yeah. No, it's always going to keep bringing in that little yeah. extra bit of cash um especially for, you, for your travel all right dude well thanks so much for coming in um Pleasure. For, for everyone that's listening or watching here how can they find you on the web or from yep. your website or your yeah yeah media? um so my handle is just creative um uh, pretty much on everything and the freebies that I was speaking about before, you can find at brandonbriefcase.com or the many places on my website where you'll get the pop-ups and everything. Yeah. So <laughs> you, you won't fail to um, find it. Yeah, I'd recommend just, even if you go to Just Creative's website, justcreative.com, yeah? Yeah. yeah. If you head to that website and, and just subscribe to it, see how Jacob has done it. Like you might not be into the content, but just see how Jacob is drip feeding this sort of stuff and giving it monthly or weekly or whatever it is content to you and see what he's doing. And you don't have to copy it. I don't think you want to copy it. You want to kind of understand what it is and what you could do for your own business um, or your own side hustle or whatever. So, you know, take a leaf out of the book, I think is a really yeah, good, definitely. good way of doing it. All right. Um, thanks so much for listening. If you're listening on the podcast or watching here on YouTube or even IGTV, and we'll see you in the next episode. Cheers. Sweet. Thanks.